meet Debbie Ellickson. She's a reporter. She covers the NHL. She's been at it for more than 10 years, maybe entire life. She has a behind-the-scenes perspective on what it's like to play in the world's top pro hockey league. And uh, it is quite complicated. So she has this book, Inside the NHL Dream. It's written for hockey fans. No shortage of them. Please welcome Debbie Ellickson. Well, uh, you've been a hockey cuckoo all your life? Yes, no doubt. <laughs> yes, but not only are you just a, a game obsessive, you're, you're, like, you are obsessed with the stats, the players, the history, everything. Since I was 11 years old, I wanted to work in the NHL, and I probably devoured every statistic on every player in every league at that time. But you never wanted to play? Oh, no, no. That's too much work. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and the outfits. I don't know. Maybe you didn't like that. Uh, so tell me, uh, in your opinion, uh, how pampered are hockey players these days? Well, the money probably makes them appear that they're pampered, but they work really hard. I mean, if you put things in perspective, these guys start playing hockey when they are three, sometimes as young as three years old. And they are, their whole lives are going to hockey rinks and and playing at that time. So they're committed. Once they get to a certain age and adolescence, then they make that decision where they're going to carry it through further. And they, the ones that make it and the ones that don't make it, there's an extra commitment to, um, f you know, to the physical aspect of the game, the mental aspect of the game. You have to push yourself a little harder. So, so they work really hard. So they deserve what you think that then then they deserve everything they get. I think the salaries are insane, but <laughs> they are insane. But uh, to to quote one of uh, my my friends, who's a hockey agent, Art Breeze, um, he uh, he says, well. The salaries are insane until it's your son or your daughter that are receiving the, the same contract. Yeah, well, that's true. And you talk about that a lot, that there are a lot of parents that think that they know better than the agents, although they always want to get an agent for the kid. Yes, yeah. So what's that all about? They, are they just because they've been so involved in the career from the beginning? Because they got up at 3 in the morning so many nights? Well, and of course, we know there are some parents who live through want to live their dreams to their, their children and um, you're right they get up in the morning and they, they live the dream as, as often as, as the children take them to the rink every, every week but um, you do get an agent once you're getting closer to being drafted because uh, you know you're looking at legal contracts and things like that but you have to wait till at least in junior before you're you're considering that because uh, there is a story in the book about uh, a parent calling calling an agent and saying his kid was fantastic and oh, next you Mario <laughs> Lemieux next Mario Lemieux and then he wouldn't say who he was he wouldn't say who the kid's name was and and finally the agent got it out of him well you know how old is your kid he was seven years old so you can imagine the pressure on that poor kid when he gets older. No kidding, and the f sort of the fever in the parent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it is a, a, a kind of a crazy business. You know, uh, me, most people um, know hockey players from seeing them on television. Mostly, they're covered up, mm -hmm. and you hardly ever <laughs> see them with that without their helmet on. And if you do, they're all bashed up and leaking everywhere, and have half a growth of beard and so on. They've been playing hard, so they don't look the same as when they get all spiffied up. But there's something about a hockey player on the street. You can you you can spot them. What is that look? They're very clean once they get out in the world. <laughs> they're well, Chris. I, I live in two different worlds: yeah. hockey and football. And there are certainly two different physiques to each sport. And hockey, their strength is from their groin area, so they're usually fairly <laughs> slim. Well, that's because, encouraging. <laughs> because <laughs> because of where they're spending most of their where their speed and and where that they comes have legs. From. Uh, although there are some, like Jerome McGinley, whose legs are quite huge. I mean, he's probably built more like a football player. Uh, but you can usually, I mean, I don't know if you can spot 90% of the Canucks on the street, uh, you, but you know who Todd Bertuzzi is and... and you know. Well, he's the size of a wa small nation. <laughs> he's so big. Now, big is not necessarily always good in, uh, in hockey, is it? In his case, it works well. Well, times have changed over the years. The the you know the days of where you had the enforcer are mm -hmm. kind of have kind of left the NHL, and 
And Eric Dehatchik says in the book where your even your fourth line now has talent and can it's skate better than they used to. Uh, and the game has changed. The players are way more talented in the sense that they have to be. Um, they have to have uh, the skill level. They have to have the commitment to the fitness area. There's there's just so much pressure to stay up, even though there's 30 teams and it seems like mm -hmm. there's a lot more jobs than there were, but there is still that pressure and you have to be so much in so much better shape than the guy next to you or you're not going to stay up very long. Well, I don't go to a lot of hockey games just because, I don't know, by the time I think about it, it's, it's all sold out. <laughs> but I mean, I did sit behind a, a bench, Edmonton bench a couple of weeks ago and I, they're so serious. I mean, they are. The pressure on them is huge. It's oh. not a game. It's not fun. It doesn't look fun. Well, they're living their dreams. They're living their childhood dreams. So the players themselves are having fun. And and you know, I I saw I see a change in Jerome McGinley in Calgary because I mean, obviously he started uh, coming into the league and he was so young and you know he was expected to you know there were some expectations on him. But then as he as he grew and we all know what happened last year. I mean he won the scoring title and he's been the darling of the NHL well what comes with that is media attention and all these other things that you know everybody and their dog wants the piece of him and wants to interview him wants something from him and he handles it like a trooper not every player is can do that can do that well I mean, he's, he's so patient but you know this is a guy who's like this far away from medical school isn't he I mean this is a guy who has a, a concept of there can be there is another life there can be another mm -hmm. life I'm with Debbie Ellickson she's the author of inside the NHL dream I would think it'd be the worst thing in the world to be interviewed after you'd lost a game oh well, it's the worst thing to go in a locker room and interview somebody after. But you must have been one of the first women allowed oh, in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, going back to Edmonton, uh, there wasn't any other women in, women reporters. And uh, um, now in Calgary, we have two other national. They're actually uh, from the score in TSN. They, they, uh, there's two female reporters. Yes. And uh, we're actually very good friends. But, but most of the time, I'm, I'm you know, it for female in the locker room. Yeah, uh, and uh, I guess that's where you get the first reaction, really, to things. That's where you get the, the first story. You walk <laughs> in there, they're, all, yeah, they're, they're pumped yeah. up. They're, they're either happy or they're depressed. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, after a game, and it depends on how much value the game is. Like, if you're playing within a team in your own division where the game could be worth four points instead of two points. Yeah. Um, for instance, any game the Oilers are playing right now or the Anaheim Ducks because they're fighting for a playoff spot. Well, yeah. I think the Ducks have just clinched one. But the Oilers, every game against... We only talk about the Canucks on this show. I'm terribly, <laughs> terribly sorry. <laughs> they're four-point games when you're playing somebody in your own division. Yeah. So uh, if you lose one of those games, they're especially in this time of year. Nobody wants to talk to you. No. Well, they're, it's not about so much that they're, they're almost clinically depressed well, when I you don't talk blame to them. them. Um, you uh, feature Anson Carter in yes. here uh, quite a bit. And you, must, you, you wrote this, of course, before he got traded. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's quite a character. I love Anson. He, um, as a matter of fact, he, the orders were in Calgary on trade day. And excuse me, and I did manage to talk to Anson shortly after he found out he was traded. He found out. He told me that uh, he had um, heard, got a call that morning from a media friend in Toronto, uh, giving him a heads up, and he had uh, didn't know about it. So he phoned his agent. His agent hadn't heard about it yet. So when he got to the rink, that's when he found out. And we talked to him. The media talked to him just shortly after after that so uh, and ironically we were talking to Yanni Ninema uh, his comments on the Carter trade and I was at a locker room when that when it happened but apparently he found out shortly after that on the television that he was traded so. on the television yeah that's always a nice one but that's common uh, that's so common they they usually find out through the media from a reporter on television that well, they how traded. unfair is that it's just the way it seems to be done. Well, I think it's rotten because, first of all, you have a, a family lots of times. You have maybe kids in school, mm -hmm. 
and uh, it's it's like uh, their father has no control over anything in his no. life, and they, it, I think it's kind of a bad policy. And imagine the guy that gets called up and down or gets treated yeah. more than once during a year, a season. Um, usually, if they're married, sometimes they're at a bit of an advantage in the sense that the wife can stay back and pack up the house and make the arrangements to move. But they want you to report, like, right now in the next city. Yeah, so you like don't even have time even. to pack. And sometimes you're treated while you're on the road, for instance, with Anson. So you only have what you have in your suitcase, and you just report to the next city and then send for your stuff later. So. Gee, even the Army doesn't move you that fast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, it is sort of being press ganged. Um, they, most teams now charter uh, yes. aircraft, don't they? all so of them do this year. They all do? Yeah, since 9-11. Right, because, well, that's for obvious reasons, I suppose, but um, and, and the kind of bonus of that, I guess you could say, is that uh, life is a little easier to if you're out here and have to keep going east. Well, there's no doubt the teams that are in the west have a more onerous schedule than, than the east, because the east, talking to Tommy Alvaline in Montreal, and he plays for New Jersey, he, he could be home that night. Within an hour, he's at home in New Jersey. But if they were out west, there's, they'd be staying overnight yes. and then flying back. Um, but uh, the travel is definitely harder. But it, it's amazing that they didn't always charter. They've gone the milk run many times on the airlines. And when you think about it, these are professional athletes. And, you know, imagine you've all flown, so imagine how small these airline seats are and you cramp these guys in a regular flight, especially if they've played a game and they're a little hurting and, and uh, if they go to travel across the country, uh, I can imagine they're, you know, if they have a swollen knee or something, it'll be about ten times as big by the time they, and they land. got there. And the charter, yeah. of course, they can move around much exactly. more. Exactly. Okay, so then there's always the pressure of the retirement, and you have a couple of stories about retirement and, mm -hmm. and and the wall that many players hit well when you're in the show and you're out of the all of a sudden out of the show it's quite it's quite difficult to watch from the sidelines it's all the, when you think about it since they were well they went away usually in junior at 15 16 to play hockey out somewhere else outside of their home city and they they haven't really most of them haven't been to school unless they, they were in college. But, you know, they don't know anything. They've never had any other job in their life except playing hockey. Mm -hmm. So it's tough. But it's the same as like, uh, like serious musicians, classical musicians, yeah. or uh, trained ballet dancers and so on. Mm -hmm. you, you have to give it everything or you don't get it. In exactly. The end. And Anson Carter is another one. Um, he has two courses left, their labs, to yeah. finish his anthropology. I think he's was bio pre med and then he switched right. into anthropology. And Anson uh, got two classes left, and he says his mother is kind of ragging on him to to finish those classes. Well, there's no way he's got to commit everything he has because you don't know how long this is going to last. It could end tomorrow. Could end, you know, next year. Not everybody's Gordy Howe. Yeah, you can't last forever at this game. So um, another part of uh, of the interviews in here with the guys that came from Russia mm. and what a tough time they had. I Apart just, from Don Cherry. <laughs> I just kind of thought one day, what would it be like to be them, you know, to, it's hard enough. I mean, the, when you're 18 and, and you're coming into the NHL, the, the difference between junior college and the pro level is, I mean, there's just no comparison at all. The, and the players are faster, stronger. You, and then there's the other pressures that surround it. Uh, uh, just the pressure to make the team, the pre you're on your own for the first time. All this stuff kind of culminates together at the same time, and plus the big paycheck that you got to figure out how to how to manage. I know if I were getting it, I'd probably spend it all in a record store. That, that one all day, in a record store. <laughs> well, the record store would never have to worry again. Yeah, because <laughs> those checks are pretty big. It must be quite shocking if you're 18 or 19 years but, old. But if you you compound that, if you're from Russia or Czechoslovakia, yeah. and you don't know a stitch of English. And coming not only trying to learn the language, and particularly when guys like McGillney and, and Igor Kravchuk came here, they were the only guy on the team that knew that language. Now, there's, chances are there's two or three other guys from the same country on the team that you can learn from. 
But at that time, they just, they could only learn on their own. They had to kind of catch it as they went along and, you know, imagine trying to communicate with your teammates and understand what your coaches want you to do. And then on top of that, learn another culture and all this. The Scandinavian guys didn't have the same kind of problems, eh? because they, they grew up uh, speak, uh, more English in schools and so on. Yeah, more English in school. They pretty much knew it when they came over. Yeah. And, and the game itself, the hockey, the environment was quite similar. Matt Sundin was saying yeah. that uh, there was a similarity in the culture when, before they came here, but it was just totally foreign to to the other guys and uh, it's very difficult. Well, you must be proud of yourself. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, who knew? Uh, I mean, I didn't know whether I was going to think that this was the most gripping thing in the world, but it was Thank you. endlessly fascinating. Thank so you're going to you. do the CFL now? <laughs> yeah, I'm In your spare time. <laughs> and many thanks to Debbie Ellickson. <laughs>